Grace, peace, and mercy be unto you from the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. All three scripture readings this morning are good. All three make good sermons. Um, I chose the epistle lesson, uh, the one about John the Baptist. Uh, that story is great. Uh, what little girl could not wish for anything more than the head of her mother's worst enemy on a platter? Um, I, she should have had something else for her birthday, obviously. And Amos, one of the prophets of old, as like all the prophets, dealt with the rebelliousness and the stubbornness of God's people, and yet he persevered and continued to be the prophet of God. But in the epistle lesson, I find something that is pertinent to us. It's all pertinent to us, but very pertinent to us in our day, in our lives, in the 21st century. I'm here to tell you what the scripture has told you this morning, that you have an inheritance. Now, I'm not talking about your parents or anybody else in your family or somebody who cares for you, but the greatest inheritance of all. Depending on who you talk to, the numbers will vary slightly, but all are agreed that sometime in the next 10 to 20 years, the most, the most money that has ever changed hands in this country will take place. Literally trillions of dollars in assets. We're not talking houses and property and things, because there's a lot more of that than there is the money. But all that money is going to change hands as generations cease to exist and money is passed on to surviving relatives and loved ones. The most money. Now we think about inheritance. I know that I'm going to get something when my parents uh, leave this world. I'm not hoping for it to happen anytime soon. And I really don't care what it is. I have two brothers. I've already told them they can have what they want. If there's anything left over, I might take it. I might not. But it's not a big deal. But when we think about inheritances, most inheritances come with some kind of stipulation. That, you know, you keep something or you provide for somebody. It's interesting. I was watching an old TV show recently, and two firemen had received, uh, been put in the wheel of somebody who had died, who had lots of money, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the lawyer came to visit, and he's sitting down, and he's going through, well, this has to be paid, and this has to be paid, and... So many thousands of dollars have to be left to take care of his cat. Uh, there was all kinds of things. And he kept asking, so what's the bottom line? He says, well, we haven't got the bottom line yet. He kept going on and on and finally says, and of course there's lawyer's fees. You know about those. Uh, the lawyers will get their cut. And so finally they got him to fess up. So what do the two of us get? And the man smiled and said, well, he says, if nothing else changes, you will each get $27.32. Now, they had gotten the letter that they were going to get this inheritance. The lawyer was going to come bring the will, and they knew the man had lots of money, and for whatever reason there was a connection. I didn't see the whole show. But they were expecting a lot bigger number than $27.32. They thought their inheritance would be big. They had plans. They were making plans on what to do with all this money. Now, at the time the TV show was shot, you could probably buy a couple of meals and go to the movie for $27.32. Today, you won't get much for that. Sure won't get a cup. Well, I guess you could get a cup of coffee for that if you don't go to Starbucks. But anyway, uh, so this inheritance, we all understand it. We all understand that there's a potential that somewhere down the road we might receive something. Sometimes they come out of the blue. Uh, as a pastor, uh, my first call up near uh, Minot Air Force Base, uh, I received word from a gentleman who owned a trailer park near the base. He was one of my parishioners that one of his uh, residents wished to speak with me and that he was dying. I didn't know the man, never met him before. Turned out he was a member, had been a member of the Lutheran Church in Missouri City, had been brought up in the LCMS all of his life, and he says, I don't have much. He says, but when I die, what's left over, I want to give to the church. I said, absolutely, not a problem. So I spent the next couple of months ministering to him because he couldn't come to the church. He was dying of cancer. Uh, he left the church, I think, something like $6,000. That's about all he had. He left it to the church, not for a specific reason, but that was the church's inheritance, what he had left so sometimes they come out of the blue. One of my neighbors back home where I grew up, after I left home uh, several years, she found out through a lawyer that uh, she had an aunt that she didn't know about. That aunt owned, owned 10 downtown blocks of Tucson, Arizona, literally worth millions of dollars. And so her lawyers helped her sell it off one block at a time. So you just never know when things are going to come your way, but you do know about one inheritance you have. It's the inheritance that's talked about this morning, and it's the inheritance that give, comes to you because you believe in Jesus Christ 
as the Son of God. So you come into this world as a sinner. At some point, you hear the gospel. Your heart's convicted. You're converted. And now you are adopted. You have earned your, not earned, you have received your inheritance in Christ. Now you receive it all. You receive all the righteousness, all the holiness, all the things that he gives you. You won't get to enjoy it in its fullness until you get to heaven. Because in this world, we live in a broken world. There's times when we don't trust our faith, we trust in man, we trust in ourselves. But we do have this inheritance, and it's guaranteed, it's sealed in the Holy Spirit. You can take this one to the bank. When you die, you are going to heaven. And you will live in all its glory for all of eternity. You get a mansion, whatever that means, with lots of rooms, whatever that means. A place that we can only imagine by the very few words we have in Scripture uh, through the Revelation and some other places, but yet they do not do justice to what we cannot begin to experience because we have imperfect bodies and imperfect senses. Like me, certain colors I can't see. I'm blessed to be able to see salmon, but some colors I can't see. When I get to heaven, I will see it not only in its full color and its full beauty, but in a way that nobody has ever seen before because we all have imperfections. I'm going to hear like I've never heard before. I'm going to smell, not smell, but I'm going to be able to smell things like I've never smelt before. And taste, because I believe we're going to have meals and have drinks. And I'm going to be able to experience all the wonderful things of heaven that go way beyond my imagination here. That's part of my inheritance. And there's only a couple of stipulations to your inheritance. They all have something. And this one is free to you, but there are a couple of things you have to do. One is you have to believe. That's pretty easy. The Holy Spirit makes that possible with the work of the gospel. And you have to repent. And that's not a one-time deal. That's throughout your life you're going to repent for the sins you've committed or that you don't know that you've committed. And that gets to be easy once you start to practice it. It's not really that bad. The third part is the one that really hurts us the most, and that's we need to do stuff. We don't do stuff to get to heaven. We don't do stuff to get our salvation. But because we've been saved, there should be in you now this compelling, driving urge to do stuff. Why? Because you have this inheritance because of God's grace, because of his love. He created you and loves you so much, all of us so much, he doesn't want one, not one, single person to die separated from sin. Sadly, not everybody is going to heaven. But because you understand the love that has been poured out for you, not just here in the things that you have, but going back almost 2,000 years to a place called Jerusalem, just outside of Jerusalem, to a hill that they call the skull or Golgotha, you remember that the one who created you as well, his son Jesus Christ, willingly gave up his life for you. Willingly, just like a lamb to the slaughter. Didn't argue, didn't complain. He willingly went out, and it was a lot hotter than it is here. There was no breeze, no shade. And they led him out to that hill, and he willingly laid himself down on that cross, and allowed them to nail him to that cross. And then he suffered the most suffering anybody can suffer for you and for me. Not because he wanted to, not because it made points with the Father, not because it got him some other reward, but because he loved the Father so much, and the Father says, I love this creation that we have created, and I want them to live. And the only way for them to live is for you, my son, to live, to suffer, and to die, and to rise again. And Jesus said, yes. He didn't hesitate. And he did that so we can have an inheritance. And you've heard me say this. Then comes the divine swap on that cross as he hung there in agony, in excruciating pain, struggling for each breath he had as he died he swapped all of his gloriousness, all of his holiness, all of the gifts that were meant for him. He says to the Father, give to the ones who believe. 
And not only did he take the ones who would believe sins, but he took everybody's sins. And for everyone who believes and repents and strives to follow God, we have an inheritance. We have an inheritance in the sense of the Old Testament. If you understand the Old Testament, in every family, the eldest son was the rightful heir to the over half of the property when dad died. Didn't have to wait for mom. When dad died, his eldest son, the firstborn, received over half. Depending on how many sons, the rest was divided up amongst them. You get some of this out of the story of the prodigal son. But this is when God talks about inheritance, and in this sense, except it's not just more than half, it's all of it. Ken gets all of it. Ron gets all of it. Darren gets all of it. Merlin gets all of it. I get all of it. There's no division. How many of you, I'm guessing pretty much every adult in this room has experienced either in their own family or know of another family where someone died and left behind stuff and they fought over it because somebody didn't get what they thought they deserved. I've seen him. It gets ugly. Again, the same parishioner that told me about the man that was dying in his trailer court had a sister-in-law and a sister, and when his mom died, she had everything in the will. Everything was done except for the amount for the funeral. She had the check made out to the funeral home, had signed it, just needed the amount put in. And the sister-in-law and the sister got together and contested the will. It got tied up in court. There were four lawyers. He explained this to me. The estate had a lawyer, he had a lawyer, sister-in-law had a lawyer, and the sister had a lawyer. He says, Pastor, she divided it up equally as equally can be, but when it's done, we'll all have pretty much nothing. The lawyers will have all. That's not what you can expect through your inheritance with Jesus Christ. Jesus has assured that you are part of his chosen people, that you are part of the royal priesthood. You have an inheritance. Your home is bought, paid for, and done. Your place in heaven is sealed. And you will live for eternity in all the glory and the holiness and the righteousness that God has promised. Are you going to suffer in this world? Absolutely. It doesn't take much if you, unless you just don't look at papers, listen to radios or TV. You know that we live in a broken world. And you have so much to be thankful for. First and foremost, that Jesus died for you and forgives you of your sins. But this inheritance, God bless you, that you have is greater than not only a single inheritance in this world, but all of them combined. All of the others come with stipulations. They come with things that can't be done. Uh, they come and they go for whatever reason. But this is assured. Sealed for you. Ready for you. You experience some of it now. You could experience all of it if you'd be willing to trust in your faith. But unfortunately, we're weak. So you have an inheritance. I can guarantee you, you'll love it when you get there. You can like it now and be content and do the things that God wants you to do. But because of those reasons, you should get up every morning and give thanks to your God and Father, your Savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit for all that you have and ask Him, Lord, what can I do for you today? Open my eyes so that I can see Jesus at work around me. Open my ears so I can hear the things people are saying, those that are in need, and open my heart to show the compassion and love of Jesus Christ that only you can show because He works through you so that others might receive. Enjoy your inheritance now, and it gets better when you get to heaven. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the one true faith, now and forever.